Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first SciCommerce mentor chat um, at our new home at Boston University. Um, I am still Tyler, um, still here. Um, <laughs> uh, and today uh, we're going to, you know, get to chat with our new <coughs> writers program editors, uh, Dennis Meredith and Andrea Messer, um, about mostly, you know, who they are, so you guys, you know, can be more comfortable with them and what they look for in a good story. So we can start getting you guys writing again. Um, Joe and Mariette, do you guys have any uh, any words? I just want to say a quick hello. So yeah, Mariette's still Mariette's still here, Dean of the College of Communication, also an alum of BU. And um, so excited to get this program underway with you all. So I just want to say hello. I hope things are going well for you as the semester's kicked off. And if um, if after you uh, if we do this, you have suggestions for us on how to improve, I'd love to hear them and I'll put my email in the chat, or you can get me on Slack. Thanks a lot. And hi, everyone. I'm uh, Joe Palka. We started this uh, merry band of SciCommers about uh, six and a half years ago uh, at NPR. Uh, you know, I used to go to conferences and, and threaten people to join if they didn't. Uh, <laughs> if they didn't, I would, I would, I would, well, I had them pull out their phones and send in an email with a request to join before they, I let them out of the room when I was speaking. Um, that was the early days. Now people are coming to us willingly, which is great. And it's really nice to uh, know that this program, which NPR was very nice about sponsoring for six years, and, and I have to say also very nice about uh, allowing it to move. Um, to be you, which we're thrilled to bits about, and, and I have great hopes that it'll grow and thrive. So thanks for joining us today. So um, everyone will have um, a Q&A at the end, so we can let Dennis and Andrea, um, you know, talk and use up this time. Um, so if you have any questions, you can always put them in the chat. Um, and during the Q and A, you can unmute and ask, or you know, I'll ask for you. Um, that is what they, they pay me to do. Um, <laughs> uh, so um, I think we will start with um, Andrea Messer. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself, um, and you know, share a little bit about yourself as a as a writer, as an editor. So my name is Andrea Messer. I um, started out actually my undergraduate degrees in chemistry. And I worked as a chemist and hated it. So I looked for something else to do and went, found this program at BU, um, a master's program in science communication in the School of Journalism. And I went there and graduated and worked on a newspaper. Then I moved to technical writing where I worked at Bell Labs for three years, um, doing horrible things like repair specifications and circuit board descriptions and notating computer programs. But I also got to help write the Bell System, the History of the Bell System Part One and a book called Innovations. So that was fun. I left there and went to Israel, six months of studying and I took a job as the only English language editor for 11 quarterly review journals in um, various forms of chemistry, high temperature chemistry, environmental chemistry, that kind of thing. Four times 11 is 44. That's 44 books a year, which is burnout territory. I lasted in that for a year, decided to come back to the States, got a job working for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers as a science writer. Worked there for eight and a half years, writing about all kinds of mechanical engineering, which includes some nuclear engineering and aerospace engineering and all that type of thing. Then I decided I wanted to go back to school and I couldn't do it without working. And I couldn't work in New York City and go to school in New York City at the same time, because that's insane. So I found a job. I got hired at Penn State to be the first science writer they had had in 11 years. And very shortly thereafter matriculated in an anthropology program. So I've been at Penn State for somewhere between 33 and 34 years, writing about engineering 
Earth and Mineral Sciences, Physical Sciences, Anthropology. And along the way, although I only wanted to get a master's in anthropology, I ended up getting a PhD in anthropology in anthropological archaeology. So I write about archaeology and anthropology as well. Um, I've freelanced throughout my career as well, mostly doing editing type things, a lot of scientific paper editing. And um, I've also edited translations and other editing type things. I don't freelance writing so much because it usually ends up being some kind of a conflict of interest. So that's it. Dennis. Um, well, when Marriott and Joe were kind enough to invite me uh, to the program, I realized that I have been freelancing for half a century. Um, and in fact, this is my first freelance piece. I still have it. <laughs> <laughs> it was in cuneiform. Um, I, I got paid in drachmas uh, or whatever talents or whatever it was. So uh, I've been freelancing for a long time. You can't leave, learn, uh, earn a living at it. So I've worked at a lot of universities over, uh, over, the, over the years as a public information officer. Um, from this list, I think you can tell I, haven't, I wasn't able to keep a job very well. Um, I'm also uh, author of a book called Explaining Research. And it has a, a, a free, freely available uh, references that you might find useful. And to see them, you click on, let me see if I can get this thing going. You click on references and resources, uh, and you'll get uh, on explaining research, you'll see a chapter 16. Uh, you go to chapter 16, and there are a whole bunch of references and resources uh, about uh, writing and, and being trained to write and so forth. Um, I think you might see this as your, uh, your uh, vision of uh, what editors are like. Uh, I want to assure you that we are not. <laughs> Uh, and to show that, I'll, I'll, I'll share this quote from a very prominent uh, editor. Oh, this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, I want to assure you that I'm not sucking up to Marriott, um, although she is a very kind and, and, and generous person. Um, I'll let you read this yourself because I think it's a very critical uh, and important uh, quote. I just want to say you should have seen me getting that past my editor at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was uh, this, this was the handbook of, of science. Uh, handbook of science writing is, is uh, uh, published some years ago. But anyway, um, I'm going to share with you some tips on writing and editing uh, that I think are important. First of all, writing is rewriting. Uh, don't worry about your first draft. It can be absolute junk because you're going to write it. You're going to rewrite it. You're going to edit it. You're going to try to perfect it before you send it uh, to an editor. That is that, that said, never submit a, a quote draft. Um, uh, make sure that your your whatever you submit to an editor is as perfect as you can possibly make it. So proofread, proofread, proofread. Uh, but recognize you'll need a proofreader. Um, you'll need somebody who, who who hasn't read the piece before and who can bring fresh eyes to it. My wife proofreads all my stuff. And she finds errors in it that, that I've missed going over my pieces over and over and over. Um, avoid text jargon, text speak, and bureaucraties. Get somebody to read your piece who is not involved in the field, and they'll tell you what, uh, you know, what they can't understand. Avoid cliches. Uh, interestingly enough, the cliche, the, uh, the phrase for being creative, think outside the box, is a cliche. So avoid cliches. Now, there are three levels of editing you, you should pay attention to when you're writing. There's conceptual editing, which is uh, looking at the overall uh, concepts you're trying to get across, the knowledge you're trying to impart. There's copy editing, which has to do with uh, sentence structure, paragraph structure, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's uh, proofreading, which has to do with looking for typos, misspellings, punctuation errors, and so forth. Um, there have been studies, uh, psychological studies, that show that you can only edit at one level uh, at a time. So when you're gonna proofread your own stuff, edit your own stuff, pay attention, just purposefully decide which level you're gonna, you're gonna edit at. Uh, be prepared to murder your children. I put journalistic in there so you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel too bad, uh, too uh, scared about it. 
Um, that is, get rid of all the uh, the things that just don't work. There may be a may be technical jargon, the metaphor or simile that doesn't work, uh, a complex explanation, too much detail. So go away from your piece for, for a month, <laughs> probably can't afford that, but a week at least, and then come back with a really uh, a ruthless editorial uh, scalpel. Ditch your writer's ego. You, remember those pictures I showed you earlier, you're gonna feel like the editor is that kind of person or creature when they come back to you with a lot of problems and, and a lot of edits, they're doing you a big favor because editors won't care about your ego. A good editor doesn't care about your ego or hurting your feelings. They only care about the reader and you'll end up with a much better piece. Uh, don't be creative. Uh, you may feel that you're a creative writer, uh, but don't be creative when you're submitting a piece to, to a, a, a publication. Slavishly uh, a mimic the style, the length, so that the editor feels comfortable that you're a professional, that you're, you're contributing something that they can use. So um, I write novels as well. And I found that there are a lot of techniques uh, that, that novelists use that you can apply to, to your writing, to your nonfiction writer. I'm not saying fictionalize your, your text, but there are a lot of techniques you can, you can apply. Uh, I'm not going to go into these in any detail, but if you read books on uh, fiction writing, you'll see that they tell you to tell stories uh, in your pieces, that is, uh, it tell, tell anecdotes about people involved because it involves your reader, write for the senses, taste, touch, sight, smell, and sound. There's, there's a rule among novelists that you try to evoke at least three of the five senses in, in every scene. Describe emotions. Uh, as a scientist, you might think, well, my, my work is dispassionate. It is not uh, very emotional, but certainly there are emotions involved. Describe them in your pieces, it will engage your, uh, your, your readers. Uh, portray conflict. By the same token, scientists tend to want to tamp down controversy, but don't do it in your articles. Highlight it, emphasize it, talk about it, be honest. This is one of the most important um, lessons in uh, fiction writing. You show, don't tell. You don't say somebody was happy. You show uh, uh, what, what show uh, actions and, and emotions and so forth that depict that happiness. Describe characters. Another, uh, another uh, rule in writing fiction is that if you don't describe the character at the beginning of your, when you introduce the character, the, the reader will have that, uh, the, their own image in their mind of the character. So uh, describe characters. If you describe characters in your pieces, it will engage your, your readers. Uh, use dynamic quotes. If there's a long quote that you have, you don't have to use the whole thing. Pull the pieces out that, that are only useful to you in terms of getting your point across. Uh, describe action. I, I read a lot of scientists writing and they tend to be very conceptual, very, uh, uh, very uh, uh, you know, ob objective and so forth. But they need, you want to ask the, a scientist when you're writing about them, what did you do? What switch did you pull? What, what uh, liquid did you pour into another liquid? And finally, use suspense. There are ways to structure uh, your fiction so that you can use suspense. So those are my, uh, my tips for you. And I'm happy to answer questions. And I'm going to try to um, share. There we are. Share. <laughs> OK, my turn now, right? Yep. <clears throat> so I take a very different approach to writing than Dennis does, because I'm trained as a journalist. And 99.9% .9 of everything I've written has been news. It's been under a thousand words, usually about 700. And it doesn't have a whole lot of what he just talked about as fiction. Um, it's just the way news writing goes. You try as hard as you can. When you have 700 words, you can't do all that much. But I'm going to back up first and say, when you're looking at a story, the first thing you have to decide is who is your audience? Who are you writing this for? Are you writing this for other people in your discipline? Are you writing this for other academics who are not in your discipline? Are you writing this for children? Is it the general public and whoever that is? Um, are you writing for politicians? Do you want a specific audience to understand what you're saying? You need to know that first. And the second thing you need to know before you start to write your story is, so what? 
if you cannot answer the question, so mm -hmm. what? Then there's no story there. Go find something else or dig deeper or do something else. Because if you can't answer the so what, what's the point of writing it? You have to avoid lots and lots of words. Um, short is better. Adjectives are not your friend when you're writing news. Um, they're usually not your friend when you're writing an opinion piece. You need to get rid of them. And some of them you will never use. Words like very, new, unless it really is new um, in a very specific way. Um, you don't want to use them. You want to go through and get rid of as many of them as you can because they're just taking up space. To get to the action part of your writing, you need to get out of the habit of writing in passive voice. And you can do that by giving the researchers the action as opposed to the other non-animate things in your story. So if you're explaining a process, the researchers tested the material, not the material was tested by the researchers. Just by switching those, and you can find them after you write the story, you can just go through and find every instance of passive voice and get rid of it. Well, you can't always get rid of it. I, I always, I have a rule that I can leave one in, um, but I try to get rid of most of them. Just by doing that, your story becomes so much more active and so much more interesting. You also don't need to introduce the story with a whole lot of background information right up at the top. Because if you do that, nobody's gonna read any further. The whole purpose of writing a story is to have people read it. And in order to have people read it, you have to grab them. Now, nothing you say can be inaccurate, but it can be kind of sexy. And that works fine. And if you can't make it sexy, you can use words that attract attention. Um, some of the best leads that I've ever written have words like snot, spit, things like that. I mean, writing about caterpillar spit is way better than writing about caterpillar excretions. Comes out of their mouth, in my mind, it's spit. The researchers are perfectly happy with that. So was I. And people read the story. As I said, you have to be accurate, but you also have to realize that most of the time, if you're writing for the general public, you're going to be writing for an eighth grade reading audience. And if you're writing for eighth graders, there are a lot of words that you can't just use. You have to explain them. Now, this changes over time. When I first started writing, there's no way you could put DNA in a story. You'd have to write out dioxyribonucleic acid every time you used it. Nowadays, you don't have to. You just put DNA and the majority of people know what you're talking about. So you have to know what words are accepted to the general public. And here, I totally agree with Dennis. Have somebody else read your story when you're done. I have my admin read my story, although She's been my admin now for 15 years, and she's not all that good at it anymore because she now understands a lot of the things I write about. So I have to find somebody else. Um, but find somebody who doesn't know the topic, who's not a scientist, to read it and make them be honest with you and say, I don't understand what this word means. Obviously, as Dennis said, you don't want to use jargon. But you have to be really careful of words that have dual meanings. So they have a meaning in the real world that we all know. And then they have a meaning in the science world that only those scientists know. And that can be very, very confusing. So make sure that you understand the meaning of a word that a scientist is using to describe something. Because it can be totally different than what you think it is. I always tell the authors that I, the researchers that I write with, that I'm not gonna write anything that's incorrect, 
but I'm not necessarily going to be complete because I can't. There's no way in that short period of time that I can cover the entire subject. But I still want it to be accurate. 99% of the time, a researcher is happy to go with that. And as a public information officer, the researchers always get to see the story. And sometimes I have to fight with them to not put back the words that I took out. But usually, they're OK with the words that I chose. Sometimes they'll say, well, you really need to put this in. And sometimes I do, and sometimes I'll argue it. But don't try to get all of it in. Get enough so that the reader understands what you're saying and you get your point across. And I think I'll just take questions from there. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I think for um, uh, right now we can sort of talk about how the writer's program process is. Um, and um, I'll, I'll do that overview. Um, I will say this now, everyone, that uh, since the move, we may um, be making tweaks to the program. Um, but um, as it stands, it will stay very similar to how it was when we were still at NPR. Um, we are actually uh, not going to start until uh, March. Um, and so we'll actually have a call for pitches um, go out in February um, and we'll send you all the same, you know, the same email with the information about that as well. Um, and it will be on the community resources um, document that we've ported over from our NPR days. Um, and from there, we will uh, choose from those pitches, um, the, the stories that will go forward um, and Dennis and uh, Andrea will work with us on that as well. Um, and you know, we'll go through the acceptance emails, rejection emails. Um, and from there, you will um, have a call with one of the editors, so Dennis or Andrea, um, about your piece. And it's not written, it's still um, in the pitch form. Um, so you can start shaping your story and making sure that you've got the pieces that you need for this to be the story you want. Um, and then you write, obviously. Um, uh, after speaking with your editor and your first draft, your editors will do um, their sort of line edits. Um, so you will have gone through the sort of conceptual editing. Um, 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 um. Did anybody else just lose Tyler? Yeah, yeah. I did too. Hey, Tyler, we can't hear you. Still can't. Uh-oh. This is, oh, that sounded good. Nope. Okay. Yeah, Don't... there it is. Okay. <laughs> You're back. Right, I hear you. Welcome home. Okay, where, where am I? Okay, you will send your pitches and then um, me and the editors, so Dennis and Andrea will work and choose pitches. Um, and then you will have a chat with your um, your editor, uh, either Dennis or Andrea. I I think we'll we'll let them, we'll let them choose maybe. Maybe that's two hunger games. Maybe I'll do choosing for who you get. Um, <laughs> um, and they will help you shape your story um, for the audience you want, and that that audience will really be prescribed to the publication that you're kind of gunning for. Um, and those of you who have gone through the writers program before um, know that we really um, uh, want you to kind of choose an outlet that you would like to write for. It just um, makes it easier for you to write in the voice of that publication. Um, uh, and then after you call your call with your editor, you will get to writing your first draft. Um, your editor will um, go through edits on that first draft. And once you um, complete those edits, then you will be assigned um, peer editors. And I think this is the main change that we've made um, from our previous uh, writer's program um, uh, peer editing situation. Um, we are thinking of going with um, 
conversations with the peer editors and the professional editor instead of each peer edit editor going through your piece individually and just giving it back so that it can be uh, more of a learning experience for the writer and the peer editors um, and get that opportunity to chat with the professional editor on uh, sort of what peer edits kind of made more sense and how they would have edited it at this stage in the game. Um, Andrea and Dennis, is there anything you'd like to add to that? It's all still in flux, everybody. <laughs> Well, I think this iterative process with with a whole group really makes a lot of sense. That's how I learned to write. Um, I would write a piece and then there'd be a roundtable discussion with the other writers uh, who were at my level. And we we learned a lot from each other. So I, it, it's a really good model, as, as far at least as far as I'm concerned. Thanks. Um, in the chat, what did you say? So Joe asked, um, uh, should people write about their own research? I think generally um, the publications that we have um, relationships with don't usually do. There are a couple um, that do prefer you to write about your own research. Um, and I will make sure that those are posted because it's the same list that we have from before. Um, so I'll just I'll double check and make sure that the community resources document with that information um, is available to you all. And for the pitching and editing process, this is from the chat. Is it going to be posted for reference? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Uh, yes, I will. I'll I'll make sure all of that is sent. It's the, um, our community resources document again. Um, and so after your peer editing um, chat, uh, you will write again. Uh, <laughs> um, and after that, um, I th usually we've had Joe come in. Um, to do sort of a final edit um, and green light it. Um, and this part of the process may also change in the future. I think for now, we've got Joe, he's on leave from NPR, so we're gonna make him do some stuff. <laughs> um, and then from there, um, you've written um, a bunch, you've been edited a bunch. Um, and once we get the green light, we will um, uh, try and uh, pitch it out to uh, publications and now the pitching to like the world is um, much different than what you would do as a freelance uh, journalist or science writer because you typically would not pitch a completed piece uh, because the editors at those publications would like a hand in um, shaping the story but we uh, we pitch to um, sort of a collection of publications that we've gathered over the years who know about the writer's program um, and know the process. Uh, we also use Joe's name as clout. Uh, <laughs> um, and can people see the side commerce work that has already been published? Yes, you can. Um, I'm gonna also make that available. Um, so far we have actually published, I have the list right here, um, 108 pieces through the writer's program over its um, tenure. Um, uh, and some of these publications actually do include uh, NPR. Um, we get a couple in Scientific American, um, some for Massive Science. Um, and so there's, there is a, there's a litany of places that you could be published in. Does anyone have questions? Let me see. If you have questions, you can unmute. Um, you can also put them in the chat, but unmuting might be easier for me. <laughs> well, I was just putting uh, a question in, which uh, I know the answer to, but I'll ask it anyway. And that is, does everybody always get published? No. They do not. Um, so with the writer's program, um, the and correct me if I am wrong, Joe, but I think the the main, uh, you know, crux of the writer's program is giving you the experience um, in a pretty low stakes environment. Um, and especially for those of you who don't quite know if you want to get into science writing. Um, 
We do get a large amount of publications. I think right now um, our publication rate is at, uh, we're at a little around like 60%, um, but it's not guaranteed. Um, we've had pieces that we've pitched um, and an editor has seen it and said, oh, this is great, I'll get back to you. And they don't get back to us. Um, uh, there are having pieces that are have just aren't a fit at the right time. Um, it could be due to timing. Uh, it could be due to uh, the newsrooms are just swamped. Um, and so we will. So the question from the chat is, do you pitch to a second choice if not published at the first? Um, we typically will pitch to um, as many uh, places until the writer wants to stop. Um, so we do pitch to your first choice first, obviously. Um, and if that doesn't pan out, then we will go to a, uh, a second um, option. Um, and if that doesn't pan out, we will we'll keep going to the options until, you know, your ego tells me not to do it anymore. But I'll, I'll keep emailing people. <laughs> um, uh, do we have a list of the publications we have relationship with? Yes, um, we do. We have a list of the publications that we um, typically will pitch to. Um, it also has like a small blurb of kind of what they're looking for. Um, I think some of them we are paused on pitching because they've been looking for COVID stories. And so it may, it may change, but we do have a list and we try to keep it updated on which ones are accepting at this time. Tyler, in the community resource document, people can see the examples of stories that have been published and all that, right? Yes. I remember seeing the links. In the so community can... resources document, you can see the list of our published pieces. It's got a link to them. Um, the publications, uh, we also have a list of publications um, and a list of some of them that, um, that do pay. Not all of them pay, um, uh, but some of them, some of them do, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's good to think about it as an opportunity to learn from experts even more that because even if you're on a staff somewhere, nobody's got maybe Joe does, but I never as a as a science journalist had 100% hit ratio with my pitches or stories and they may get as as Tyler said, you know, not used for quite a variety of reasons. A lot of them may have nothing to do with you. So I there's, had there's another uh, question. Sorry, I, I was just going to say Mariette, I had I, I think I have a pretty close to 100%, but what I've done instead is I've put journals out of business. I had <laughs> articles accepted for Science 86 or Science huh. 80X, Science yeah, Digest. You, I remember those. And, so you killed them. <laughs> three publications that, that went belly up before my piece got published. Uh, so yeah. I, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, yeah. Anyway, I mean, my solution was become editor in chief, but even then, <laughs> it <didn't> always work. <laughs> <laughs> Can I um, add one other thing that just occurred to me, and, and I don't, I, I mean, car carry on, but so, there's questions about the, the timing of all this. This is, this is not hard news turnaround tomorrow kind of thing. So don't pick anything to pitch that's going to age out really quickly. Um, that just isn't going to work. Um, it, yeah. it, I mean, it, it shouldn't be. There's plenty of stuff that doesn't get covered in the in the mainstream media that that will be new and newsy, but it, it, it can't be, you know, in a paper published today kind of thing, because that's that's going to be big trouble. Those yeah. aren't the best stories to write on uh, anyway. <laughs> I hate those uh, sort of this is what nature just published stories. <laughs> so there are several additional questions in there, Tyler, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the questions from the chat says, uh, is there a cycle to the writer's program? Um, it's, it sounds like you're accepting pitches in March and is it continuous from then on? Yeah, so previously we've done it monthly where we've taken um, about two months off. Um, and within that month, that is when you will go through sort of this iterative process of writing. Um, and so if we use uh, March as an example, then we'll actually send the call for pitches out um, in February. So it gives you guys time to, you know, decide if you want to and send a pitch and then for us to like choose the pitches. Um, so that by time you call your, you have a call with your editor, it's actually the end of February, maybe early March, depending on your editor, on editor schedules. 
Um, and so you'll be going through the writing and the editing processes throughout March. Um, and hopefully your final draft um, is good for pitching, or at least it gets to Joe by the end of March. Um, so uh, it's kind of a, a monthly cycle of putting out pitches, but the writing process from like pitch to publish um, is about a month and a half, give and take, give or take some change. And it may be longer just because once we get to the point where we um, send it out to publications, it is whether that editor has the capacity to email back. <laughs> then there are a couple of questions about um, accessing the content accessing the community resources document uh the community resources document at this point is still um a google drive document as it was with npr and i will um uh, send that link out at the end of the mentor chat um and when i also uh post our recording of it so you guys will get all of the resources that we've talked about at the end of the mentor chat i just don't want my my keyboard it's uh, it's mechanical it's very clacky it'll ruin the sound for anyone who wants to listen later <laughs> um and so are there any plans on developing writing for podcasts or radio in addition to text-based outlets i don't know if i can answer this um i think right now we've kind of focused on writing just because um uh, when it was when it was when the writers room was started, it focused on writing. Um, mm. I think that's a Mariette question, actually. She's like head boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, we have a um, so in our programming for the next few months. So we have a what are we talking about getting a podcasting mentor chat? So we were a podcasting mentor chat, but yeah. I don't know if the writers program. Yeah, but um, for it, but maybe. Yeah, I mean, depending on who we get in for that it might be that we could work out if there's a lot of interest there it might be we could work out with somebody whether they could do a bit of coaching around samples of writing but a, you know a formalized podcast writing program might be um we'd have to see the level of interest develop to start that because you gotta put people in place and all that no i just to say historically we have not which is funny since we were at nbr but um uh it's yeah it's a different kettle of fish and and it is still writing i mean uh uh at least as most podcasts no i shouldn't say that i don't know if it's true for most podcasts a lot of podcasts are are scripted carefully um and uh so writing writing for the ear is an, is an interesting thing i will say that the number of outlets that we could publish freelance podcast episodes or freelance radio pieces is pretty small. So it's not maybe not such a such a question of whether or not we could help you write something as whether we could ever find a place to put it. Um, but I'm, I may be wrong. I mean, there's SoundCloud. You can you, you can just put anything there. But the question we've we've been I mean, the idea with all this, maybe it would be just as well. I mean, the idea is we want you to feel like this is the start of something that you're going to want to do more of, um, that you that that it's exciting, that it's fun. I mean, I get a I get a big thrill every time I you know see my name in print, and you'd think it would get old. It doesn't. I um, I like it, and so I I hope that you know the experience is such that you'll want to do more of it. Um, that, that was the idea behind the site commerce to begin with. So um, we we are anything that will help you move forward. Uh, and it doesn't mean you have to become, I want to say this very clearly too, it doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't mean you have to become a science writer full time. This is for people who um, want to get better at it, whether they make it a full time activity or a part time activity or a full part-time, I mean, whatever. It's just that it, there's no expectation that you jump into a different career. Uh, it's it's not, that's not what we're doing. At least that's not what we were doing. I mean, Marriott might want to. Yeah, it's not, it's not what we're doing. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if people wanted to become science journalists, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, although I've certainly loved it. Um, but your own answer would be an individual one. What I hope people will get out of the writer's program is 
you know, that you, that you find it fun, that you learn about different approaches you might take, and that it really helps you feel more comfortable with your writing in general. Alberto has his hand up. Uh, hello, thank you. Yes, I have more of a meta question uh, because of the new relationship. Um, it's my understanding that's, uh, and I'm new to this community, so thank you, Tyler, for, for the introduction. Um, I uh, get a lot of inquiries because of my diversity science communication project on how graduate students and postdocs can learn how to get into uh, this gig. Um, and so I recommend this. But now with the new relationship, is it going to still remain sort of like a free program or is there a long term plan yep. for it to be a, uh, a, a for pay a project? Because my experience is with the op ed project, which has sort of a similar model workshops and then mentoring by experienced people, but they have a, a cost associated with it. Yeah, no, as long as it's possible for us to keep it free, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, I'm very grateful for some foundation support this year from the Reed Allen Foundation, Burroughs Welcome. I'm always looking for additional suggestions for places we might do outreach for, because obviously there are costs associated with anything anybody does, but it's my goal that it stays free. Hi, I got a prompt that says the hosts want me to unmute. So I'm assuming that means I can speak. So I just wanted to respond to um, both Joe and Marie, your uh, comments about what you hope this program would be. My name is John. I'm a PhD student over at Johns Hopkins. And I just wanted to respond by saying thank you for even organizing this. By the way, I am also a BU alum myself. Um, because in, you know, in, just speaking for myself, but I know I'm not the only one in my PhD program, science communication is something that interests me so much, particularly in public health. And right now with the pandemic, it's something that's on my mind all the time, but we don't have formalized training. We don't have formal opportunities for us to go through these types of opportunities. So there are people like me who are just on the internet doing Google searches. What are the opportunities? Like, where can I find a community and something upon this one? So I just want to ex personally express thanks and gratitude for you guys to coordinate this type of program. It, it's very much needed and there are, many, many people out there like myself who are just craving for opportunities like this. So thank you. That's kind of you. I, I yeah. want to thank Joe for the great idea in the first place. And, well, other and you know, helping. John, if I may, it's one of the crazy things, and it, it's just particularly true in your case, is that Johns Hopkins has one of the best science writing programs around. And the fact that the resources don't trickle or you know, spread out to make them available for everybody. And one of my goals uh, that that I have, I'm actually, that's one of the things I'll be doing while I'm on this break from NPR is trying to find resources um, so that, you know, oh, I'd like, like somebody asked about podcasts. I know that there are web webinars and videos about how to get started in podcasting. And I know that Transom, for example, transom.org is a, is, you know, Atlantic Public Media, the same guy who does uh, uh, the Moth Radio Hour, if you're a fan, fan of that. Anyway, they put out stuff, you know, how to how to record an interview, how to, how to buy a tape recorder. I mean, there's a lot of how-to stuff out there, and, and, and a lot of it you can, you, you can find, John, you know, as you say, you can find it, but it's, we would like to make it easier, and, and that's, I mean, it, but it, it truly, it truly drives me nuts when I find out that there are people who are doing SciComm. I went, I, well, I won't name the university, but I went to a university uh, a few years ago and, and uh, I gave a talk. I recruited some of the early uh, members of the SciComm community came from there. And uh, I was just talking with faculty members on their science communication program. They never heard of this, never heard of me. I mean, they heard of me maybe, maybe but they, they never heard of anything that we were doing in this domain. I'm thinking, well, you know, but these are big schools and I don't know about BU, but most places are sort of stovepiped or whatever the term is. And so- Siloed. Siloed, thank you. Because that's to, in don't response use that, to your saying. That's one of Dennis's cliches. <laughs> In response to your your comment about the SciComm program, science writing, excuse me, program we have at Johns Hopkins, that's exactly the case. Even you know, not to speak poorly about my university, I really like it, but I'm I'm a student here, but I didn't even know about it until later on. And then when I contacted them, long story short, I'm not even eligible because I'm already a current student in another program. 
Yeah. So there, there are barriers like these that does prevent people like me who are interested from accessing the resources. So it's up to me to kind of like go through the internet to find opportunities. So coming across this one, which I'm really grateful for. Well, we're glad I'm, thank you. I'm glad you found us. Hope you'll be able to help. That's the other thing is we would like to let everybody know that this exists. And it, if, I mean, six years ago, of course, nobody knew about it. Now it's getting a little more traction, but we could still use uh, proselytizing. So uh, I want Marriott to be so successful that she'll have to raise a lot of money. Working on it. I like suggestions. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I like the connections. Those are always terrific. Yeah, anybody, anybody who's independently wealthy and wants to be part of the program is most welcome. <laughs> well, I, I'm not independently wealthy, but what I will say is I recently <laughs> was offered um, a fellowship opportunities with the American Journal of Public Health, actually, for students. Um, and maybe I'll just keep in touch and we can forge a connection. We'll see. It's awesome. I love collaborations. I see there's another question. There's more just a follow up. Um, so I don't know if you're aware of the NIH funded programs across the uh, U.S. that allowed uh, graduate students in particular to consider you know, post-academic alternative careers. That's where I've seen that universities have taken on science communication training, science policy training, and other things. <clears throat> I'm associated uh, through my wife with the University of California, Irvine, and they had one of the bigger programs, um, and they had a prominent uh, radio journalist run a science communication course here. But the problem is when the grant ran out, they weren't able to uh, institutionalize that person's salary. So they at least have video recordings, but uh, they've only been able to institutionalize their science policy training. Um, but uh, if the NIH has another round of those grants, that's what I recommend. Um, and so that's a, a longer conversation, but you can check out uh, GPS-STEM at uh, UC Irvine is just one example. And there were maybe 20 sites across the nation um, it, I just don't know if the grant program, I believe it's called the best program still exists. Yeah, here's a, here's a historical uh, <clears throat> fact about the uh, best program. Uh, the SciComers actually owe its existence to the best program in some ways because um, Maddie Sophia, who, who was the person who helped me get this off the ground, um, came to be an intern at uh, NPR because she got an externship from the best program at the University of Rochester, which they called You Are Best. Isn't that great? I wonder if folks have other questions about, about writing for Dennis and Andrea. By the way, I'll throw in a tip because you were uh, picking on adjectives and I agree with that. I knew an editor who used to circle all of the verbs in his stories before he turned the piece in just to make sure each one was doing the maximum work. Like why say walked when you could say sauntered, strode, jogged, you know, and so on. And I thought that's actually a very powerful, little powerful little word, those verbs. Anyway, maybe you have other questions or thoughts. I have another question more about the public information officer types of positions. So um, I'm asking because I started doing some part-time work at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in um, public relations work for a particular department. Um, but since I'm do doing most of that work on my own, I have a hard time finding ways for proofreading to get proofreading from other people. Um, so, I mean, I usually go through rounds of edits with the people that I'm either interviewing for an, a particular article or things like that. But I just was wondering if you had any advice for people in those kinds of positions for developing um, like a feedback system with other people. The best thing, if you're, if you're just looking for proofreading um, and, and, and also contact check is to ask somebody in your family. I used to run everything past my um, eighth grade nieces and nephews because it was a perfect place to make sure that people understood the stories. And surprisingly, they are far better than I am at finding weird typos and strange grammar. Um, I'm probably the worst speller that anyone will ever meet. And so, <laughs> 
Um, if, if it doesn't get caught by the spell checker, if it's like actually a word, I'll never see it because I won't realize that it's misspelled. Um, eighth graders do, do find those, but you know, other, other people would find it as well. And, you know, I find that they like to read the stories. So, you know, it's never been much of a problem. Um, don't rely on the researchers. I don't know, you know, what kind of researchers you're dealing with, but many of the ones that I deal with are not native English speakers. And unfortunately, there are a lot of non-native English speakers who decide that they know English better than a trained writer, which causes problems. But also many of them in their countries of origin learned English in the British style. And there are a whole bunch of differences between British English and American English, um, not just spelling. I mean, there are, other, there are other differences. And so they will wanna change things to that. But I mean, the best thing, if you're freelancing, the best thing you can do is find a friend, a niece, a nephew, a, a child, um, a spouse, whatever, to read it for you. No, I, I advise uh, writers to find somebody to edit your work who doesn't like you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> because you don't want somebody who's going to just praise your work and so forth. Tell them uh, if they do like you, tell, do something that makes them not like you temporarily, at least. Um, so they're willing to really be tough on you because that's what you're looking for. Um, so you can also form a writer's groups, informal writer's groups. There are a lot of them around that have to do with fiction. Uh, so that doesn't help you very much, but you, you never know. A, a fiction writer's group might be perfectly willing to, to read uh, your nonfiction piece. And, and when you're in that group, uh, you're gonna learn fiction writing, which means you're gonna learn some, some of the techniques that I talked about of, of engaging uh, readers and keeping them reading. So uh, check, check and see if there's some small uh, short story writers groups around uh, that, that can help you out. But again, find somebody who uh, doesn't like you very much who uh, either you don't owe, don't some, not anybody that you owe money to or, or owes money uh, uh, to you so that they feel uh, uh, obligated to you to be nice to you. And I, I think it's in the chat, but I'll just say it out loud as well. Remember you have Slack channels to ask other site commerce for help too. find some buddies there. Um, also, there are a lot of online writers groups uh, that you should check out. Uh, and they offer, uh, you know, you, you, you'll you agree to read some of their stuff if they'll agree to read your stuff. And so that that is a really useful uh, way to do it. And then, that you, so you don't have to have somebody in your town to, to read your stuff. It can be anywhere. Thank you. Those are all really helpful ideas. Thanks for the question. So we're creeping up to the hour, Tyler. What do you think? Does anyone else have any last questions? Is that now? I'm serious. I think I'm going to drag my mother into this. She's a great proofreader. <laughs> she <laughs> likes to point out to me great. that she scored higher on the essay or the uh, what is it called the uh, what do you get to to go into graduate school the, the GREs GREs yeah she has scored higher on the GREs in English than I did. Um, <laughs> And uh, she was in charge of publications at the Whitney Museum for 25 years, so she's used to reading stuff. So if you if you really need somebody, <laughs> she'd probably be great. She doesn't understand a thing about science, so you <laughs> have a good audience there too. I see. There's one more question there. Yes, Edward, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Well, I guess, like first off, like you know, thanks to all of you for organizing this and being here today. And you know, if I could ask something, it would be like, what are your thoughts on something that's you know. A little bit longer, maybe more like a magazine and less like a news. So like something that the New Yorker or that Vantage would run. Um, I'll quickly go so. Um, I think right now the publications that we have relationships with um, prefer pieces that are in the seven hundred to eight hundred word range. Uh, I mean, if you know someone at the Atlantic, it, who's like taking pitches i mean well we can pitch them um but um i would just always keep in mind what the publications want like first like if you are pitching to a publication that accepts like a thousand words and andrea and dennis will tell me i tell me if i am wrong i mean 
if that is what they are looking for, then I'm sure you you can and should. But most of the places that we specifically pitch to are looking for, again, those like 700, 800, really closer to 700 word pieces. That's just, interesting because a lot of the places I work for look for 1,500, 2,000 words, stuff like that. Um, look, look for longer pieces. I guess my advice is to go to the um, pages of the magazine of the publications that, that specify what they're looking for. And if they're looking for longer pieces, consider a longer piece. Uh, and if you have a, a, an idea that warrants a, a really long, a nice long piece, then, then go for it. Yeah, and I, I would only add that um, places like Atlantic and New Yorker are not gonna accept a fully written 5,000 word piece because they're they get involved in the editorial process far earlier than that and you know Dennis and Andre are fine editors but they're going to be they're they're, they're not going to hand a piece to a New Yorker and have it go in publication mm -hmm. um so I think that's why we sort of shot for a smaller size and and by the way I mean as as much as I and Dennis and Andrea are uh, capable of editing and we'll do our best for you, you can expect that once a publication comes along, that editor is going to say, who the hell edited this? this is terrible, but we see something we can fix. You know, that's, that's another thing you know, editors do a lot of is piss on other editors, but that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well as, as an editor, all right, all right, all right. I just want to add, uh, I just want to add two quick things on that. So first, first of all, good for you that you have the ambition to write a longer piece. I know a lot of students who would really rather not, <laughs> you know, here at the college. Um, I, with most editors, they would like to see something shorter that you delivered successfully that they were happy with before trusting you with a larger assignment. So I would say keep keep that ambition there. Go for something where you can, you know, kind of demonstrate your skills once or twice, might be three times with a smaller piece and then say, hey, I've got a big dream. Could I regale you? And by then, you know, as wonderful as, as Andrea, Dennis and Joe are, or me for that matter, and Tyler, you won't be needing us, right? You'd already have that relationship. So, you know, as you cultivate relationships like that with different editors, you, you'll probably know when the time is right to propose something larger. And there's Good an idea. old saying, there's an old saying, I had to, I wrote it long because I didn't have time to write it short. I love that um, saying. <laughs> so if you have a long piece in mind, think about whether, whether you're really puffing it up a little bit and whether you can boil it down and crystallize it in a way uh, that meets a shorter, uh, a shorter requirement uh, for a publication. I was just going to say the same thing. It is so much easier to write long than it is to write short. Writing short is just hard. Um, and I've, in my entire career, I have written three stories that were longer than a thousand words. And only under duress because <coughs> I'm just used to writing short, but it is hard to get it into that, that word thing. And sometimes it's a thousand words and I have to cut it down to 700 and you can do it. <laughs> but, <coughs> excuse me. But um, if you can write long, if you can write short, you can write long, basically. And it's been my experience I, over the years, I, I've written a lot of short pieces and then I started writing books. And if you get into, really get into the sense writing business and you end up writing books, you're gonna find out that you've developed such muscles uh, writing muscles that writing a short piece is absolutely trivial so uh this is not for people who are going to do this casually but if you get into the business and end up writing a book or two or three then you're going to find that you have real you know schwarzenegger type muscles writing muscles sorry i don't have <laughs> And on that note, um, I think we will end this mentor chat. Thank you, Dennis and Andrea and Joe and Mariette for coming. Thank you all um, in the audience for coming. Um, I will post the recording. Let me go ahead and stop it.